Welcome to the Jolly Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Barrett. This podcast is for those who are interested in the conversation around diversity, inclusion, and equity. Each week, I'll be interviewing a guest who has something special to share or is actively part of building solutions in this space. Let's get started. Lisa Brewer is the owner-director of Mission Art 415 Gallery and president of Mission Art 415, a nonprofit organization. Founder of the Lilac Mural Project, San Francisco, and international art gallery fine art brokerage. Singapore, Dubai, Moscow, London, New York City, and Paris. She also sits on the San Francisco Supervisors Board for Graffiti Abatement, and she's the proud member of the San Francisco Department of Public Works Adopt a Street since 2004. She's the curator of Mission Art 415, the Lilac Mural Project covering over 14 city blocks in the Mission District of San Francisco, which has the largest exterior art collection in the world. Mission Art 415 works with local and international street artists in support of their amazing artistic talent, along with the property owners who are challenged with inner city graffiti vandalism. Lisa believes offering a commission mural is the solution to graffiti vandalism. The artists share their talent in an outdoor art gallery, and the property owner enjoys amazing art that is unscathed by tagging. The Mission Art 415 Gallery, located at 2884 Mission Street in San Francisco, California, showcases 36 local artists within various genres to proudly promote amazing art culture of San Francisco. Mission Art 415 proudly offers educational mural tours around the Lilac Mural Project, located on Lilac Street and 24th Street in the Mission District of San Francisco. Okay, so I am really, I'm again excited this week to talk with Lisa Brewer, and she is doing amazing things in the city of San Francisco. And I really wanted to, aside from you being just so transformative in terms of, you know, representation and diversity and inclusion, we can talk a lot about your gallery and the Lilac Mural Project, the Mission 415 Lilac Mural Project. Um, and so, but I really just wanted to start by talking about, you know, maybe you could give us some context for how you even got into this. How did you even end up in San Francisco? All of those things. Well, first of all, I'm really honored to speak with you about this because it is, it's, I'm so passionate about this journey that I've been on. And it's just, my mom used to have a saying that God will put you where you're meant to be. And that's pretty much how I've lived my life. I mean, you plan things, but every once in a while you're taken to a place and you're like, what am I doing here? And then this magical thing unfolds. So I'll go back to, oh, two, two decades ago, um, I moved to San Francisco to be with my now husband, Randolph. And we lived in San Francisco proper, but we lived in the Mission District. And at that time, we're going back 20 some years, it was really dangerous. It is it's less dangerous now. So if anybody's familiar with the Mission District, it's predominantly working class, Latino, hardworking people. But there was a big gang problem when we moved here. And so we had the Norteños at one end of where we lived, a little street that ran parallel to the Mission called Lilac Street. And it was really conducive to the BART station on 24th, which I took every day to go down to my gallery job down at the, in the um, Embarcadero. So I moved to San Francisco, fell in love with because it's so diverse in culture and color. They opened fruit markets. And it's just, I always felt like I was on vacation. I was somewhere else. So we loved the mission, but we, the, our exterior environment was very challenging. Hmm. So right off the of mission, you have the BART station, and then you have Mission Street. And it was, it was really conducive for a lot of bad behavior because you could hide behind this little tiny alley. And when you would look down this 24th block of Lilac, right behind the McDonald's, um, it just was the most seedy, toxic, urban decay, neglect. And it was just, it, it affects me psychologically. So when I was younger, I, I went to school for psycholo existential psychology. So I would walk down the street and be like, 
what happened where? So I would be so conflicted, um, not only just viscerally in a physical way, but psychologically it affected me. Like, what happened where? Did somebody not love these kids? Did they need more, more parental guidance? Do I help? Do I get offended? And there was a lot of drug use at that time. And it really hit me because there were women my age shooting heroin, which in my lifetime, I've been through a lot. That was never an option. Like you either, it hurts, you get over it, you move on and you go to a better path. So I would find myself wanting to befriend these people because out of humanity and curiosity. And um, it was just, it, I can't even articulate the challenge from an intellectual standpoint. When you see somebody your age shooting up heroin in the street, you should have a family or be loved by somebody and you're trying to help, but you don't know how to help. So that was the precursor to all this. So I said to my husband, I cannot be on the street and step over these people every day on the way to my seven figure job in an art gallery as a, as a very responsible director in brokering art internationally. I'm like, I can't do it. It's killing me. And I said, I've got to move to somewhere like the Marina. It's killing me. And he's like, well, they said, let's bring in a muralist. And, I, and this is, I'm just giving you the whole, the honest story of this. He said, let's bring in someone to paint the exterior of our flat. That way, when you come home, You'll have something to, to walk into nicely to greet you. So as I do this, um, these mural projects, and I speak about this at City Hall, if you have tagging on a building, if you have graffiti vandalism, it precipitates bad behavior. And the theory is, from an existential point of view, if I don't care about my property, then you shouldn't care about my property. But go ahead and behave poorly. So when you look down this one street, it was nothing but black and red, silver, two-color throw-ups, they call it was awful. So you had all this bad like energy coming in. So I said to Randolph, I'm like, you know what? I grew up in rural Pennsylvania. If somebody painted on my building, I would instantly have them arrested. So I'm coming from that whole paradigm. You don't paint this way's house. It just doesn't happen. So he would say, you know, you're in a city. You know, you do what you do when you're in a city. The only way to combat that is putting something beautiful on it. So I was not buying it. And then what I really wasn't buying is that we were paying for it. I'm <laughs> you know, can we just buy a house first? Can we get our own stuff? So we had this kind of interesting um, pass, passage when we first started. So we found an artist, his name is Cuba. Cuba is actually inducted in the Library of Congress as being the graffiti, uh, the godfather of graffiti. And Cuba came from Baltimore, Maryland. He was one of four um, siblings from a black family. But he moved to San Francisco to be homeless to follow the Grateful Dead. And it wasn't that Cuba was a great artist, God rest his soul, he's no longer with us. It was that he was everywhere. He was, his name was everywhere. In this, and that was something that happened probably in the late 90s, early 2000s. People just tagged their name everywhere. So they were branding themselves, which is kind of genius. So we brought in Cuba, and Cuba brought in Mark Bodie. Mark Bodie is known, and I'm sure your viewers will know this, his father was Von Bodie. Von Bodie was known as the Brown comic book creator. And he started the comic book in Hate Ashbury in the 60s. And there's, if you Google Von Bodie, you'll see Janis Joplin reading his comic books and Jimi Hendrix. And he was one of those. He was also one of the first trans, trans dressers in San Francisco. So there was a big billboard that went down um, the freeway and it had a Bodie, who honestly looks like Jesus Christ. He had the white gauze gown on with the long hippie hair. And it said, it was from Apple. And it said, think outside the box, well, like Ron Bodie. And Apple was promoting him as being a legendary creative thinker. So Mark Bodie, being his only son, inherited all Vaughn's creative when Vaughn passed. And Vaughn passed at a very young age. Um, so Mark went to school. I think he was educated at Brown, the fierce education in animation, very well-known cartoonist. He was also the creator of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So when Cuba brought in Mark Bodie with all this pedigree, the world opened up. And I'm not getting it because I, I was in, in that space. Even though it's art, and more of a Matisse, Renoir, kind of, you know, Monet kind of art space. And my husband is all about the graffiti. And he knew all these people. And he would be like, Lisa, it's Juan Bodie, it's Mark Bodie, it's Cuba. And I'm like, so, who are these people? I don't know them. So he would nudge me and let me know who they were. I don't know who they are. I mean, I treat all people beautifully as you know, just children of God, but I wasn't starstruck by anybody by any means. So looking back over 20 years, the people that Randolph introduced me to are known as the legends of graffiti. Graffiti, when I first started this project with Randolph, it was known as vandalism. It was a crime. It was a lowbrow art form that only vandals did. 
So somewhere after Andy Warhol discovered Jean Michel Basquiat, Basquiat's graffiti became a pretty big thing. So I think Basquiat was the first graffiti artist that actually was brokered at Sotheby's for like 2.5 million. It is not a mural. It is raw, guttural, in the true, truest sense of the word, graffiti. So from that point, when Sotheby's recognized, okay, this is something, then universities picked it up as a respected studied art genre. So I watched that metamorphosis. So when I would work with Department of Public Works or City Hall or supervisors, I always called it urban art or street art. If I went in and threw out that G word, that graffiti word, they would look at me like, oh no, this is a crime. So I watched the evolution of this once, you know, toxic thing to do turn into this really respected art form. So right. in, in this process, it took us about, oh, I'd say a year to actually gain momentum to get these, these artists painting this one little tiny street. And it is a innocuous little side street. Nobody would notice it. So we painted our property with permission from our landlord and it was beautiful. And then I watched this something magical happen. Like our neighbors would come out. Now, Lilac Street in the city here, especially in the Mission, all the side streets were once carriage houses. So you'd take, take your horse and buggy into these garages and you'd park your horse and buggy in there. So the opposite end, the house, the master's house, opulent. Like, you know, $2 million properties with lanai's in the background. And then these little carriage houses. So with the gentrification, they were refurbishing these carriage houses into apartments, but still not part of the main house. The main house on Cap Street, which runs parallel to Lilac, it, they're mansions. So all in San Francisco, a lot of the side streets were carriage houses. So there was a lot of tagging and then it would bring in that bad element. So we were on this little tiny side street and one mural turned into two, turned into 15 blocks. And it was just, it was, we were at the right place at the right time with open hearts and open minds. And my mind wasn't as open as Randolph's was. He, he got it. He is a true visionary. He will understand greatness way before it happens. I need a little bit more convincing because of my more educational, logical mind. Like, mm, let's see all this through. Let's think about the variables. And I really didn't get the fact that we were paying for everything because we were struggling ourselves. Like we were not living large with trust accounts. We're eating ramen to buy paint to, to you know, beautify the environment. City Hall wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. It was just a pet project, like no funding, absolutely. Actually, we've never received a scintilla of funding. And we worked on the Earl Gage Jr. Mural Project, which was last year from Supervisor Dean Preston. The only time in our path anyone ever funded or offered to fund anything. So that's how the story started. And I know I'm, I'm just speaking here going on, but the magical journey was the meeting of the artists. Right. And because we were in it and we're cleaning up the streets and I'm you know, picking up needles and defecation and gloved up in hazmat suit and then buying lunch and we're, we're building a family. And it was in the family process that the artists came. And then it was predominantly just artists from the the San Francisco area, and then artists from around the world came, and it became an extended family. And we've got about, geez, 6,500 artists that work in Mission R415 in our blocks. Oh, my and it's, goodness. It's a, it's a rotating canvas, but they call me Mama Lisa. Um, they're our family. We love them. If they come in a day or they need $10 or whatever, we give it to them. It's, it's a relationship that far surpasses, gee, I painted on a building for these people. We just took them in as our own. But, but what was so interesting to me, though, is because I don't know if people can quite understand the concept that you took it because I didn't. I Honestly, I mean, I don't live in San Francisco, but I have lived in the Bay Area now for decades, we'll just call it. Um, and when I went and saw the the alley that you showed, I saw like one block. I, I you know, I haven't even made it to all. 14 or 15 blocks, but it's an amazing collection of artwork that is represented by so many different um, cultures. And it's literally on people's houses, um, which I was like, wait, I don't know if I would, if I would put a mural on my house. Um, so, and then, you know, you were telling me about the story of one person who didn't want to paint a mural on the house and yet that house keeps getting tagged all the time. 
<laughs> it's been an amazing case study because I, like you, or most people, you're, you're properly proud. You have your house, you want to paint it whatever color, and you have your garage and your flowers in it, and that's your home. Painting on an exterior property space in somebody's home blew my mind, first of all, because it's just something coming from you know Pennsylvania you don't see. So I had a really hard time adjusting to that. But it turned this, you have two choices in the city. In a city like the Mission or um, Haight-Ashbury, in the more trendy places, you have the option to have either a mural or a lot of graffiti vandalism. And graffiti vandalism, there's a psychological component that makes it very unappealing. It's ugly. It's it's, it's somebody's name. It's just, it's haphazard. They're going by and it's, you're, it's just kind of destruction of property is what, how I look at it. When you put a mural up, it becomes a beautiful work of art. So you have two options because if you have a clean exterior space, it turns into a canvas and either a muralist is going to paint it or you're going to get tagging. So pre COVID and they're going to reinstill this. I sit on the um, San Francisco graffiti abatement advisory board, That's which is appointed by the supervisors. <laughs> and here's, here's the, and because I have this 20 some year case study of this project, I can articulate to nauseam what does and does not work. You have a clean canvas. It's going to be tagged. Somebody's going to come in at three in the morning on a skateboard and throw their name up there. And then somebody else throws their name on top of that. And it becomes a bit of a battle. It becomes an ego battle wall. Okay. They went over my name. Then I put my name. It just becomes this huge tagging. And there's, we have several examples of this property owner will not give permission to paint. They go out and paint it. And then it's tagged. So pre COVID, the San Francisco Department of Public Works had a law, a mandated law, that if you have tagging, graffiti vandalism on your property, you are fined $500 a day until you paint it. It's like a half, well, it's, a, it's like two properties long. She, Miss, Miss Lee is her name. Thank you, Miss Lee. She's had me, she's called the police on me so many times. So Miss Lee does not want a mural. So I'm like, no worries. I, I get it. It's your property. But so she paints it green, beautiful moss green. And then every night, every morning when she wakes up, it's tagged. I'm talking, there's not one, it's bubble letters. It's two color throw ups. It's a bomb. It's all these different forms. It's, it's a great lesson on graffiti because it's every hand style form on this one wall. And then she has to go out and paint it or she's going to be fined $500. So she, I'm like, I said to her not too long ago, Miss Lee, I know you don't like murals, but let's just break this down mathematically and, and sweat equity. You've been out here for 23 years that I know of painting your property. How much is a gallon of paint? Kelly Moore, $65 a gallon. I buy them all the time for the artists. I'm like, you're spending money on not any painting, but the labor, the sweat equity, and then the frustration. I'm like, do this, just do the actuary over 23 years, what you spent on paint. Put a euro up. This leave is not happening. <laughs> At all. So randomly, I always tell the artists that we know, do not touch Miss Lee's property because she will have you arrested without equivocation. That cop car is going to come down and say, hey, Lisa, you know, and then I have to end up painting a property for her. So I'm like, guys, just avoid her. Yeah. So COVID came and everybody stopped everything. There's no graffiti abatement law. There's no anything. You're hunkered down. You're sheltered in place. The only people on the streets here in the mission were the, the taggers and they bombed the place. Bombing is when you take a giant... It's called a fat cap. It's a, an aerosol can. The, the cap has a nozzle on it like this. And you put that nozzle on, and it's like a paint sprayer. And it just sprays. That whole can will go in a nanosecond. It's like a big spray gun. And then they have a thin cap. There's like 35 different caps to use on these aerosol cans to get your desired effect. But they'll take a fat cap, just bomb. They bomb the whole entire area. So now I'm working with City Hall to try to bring this back to good. Let's reinstate these graffiti vandal laws and the abatement and all that. But so during the reason I'm telling you this, during that time period, Miss Lee does not live here. She, she was hunkered down wherever she was. And so we had a couple artists come in and I'm like, guys, I'm just telling you, I can't tell you not to paint on this property. It's not mine. But I'm telling you, if Miss Lee rolls it in her Mercedes, you better run because she won't throw you in jail. And so they're like, oh, we'll take our chances. They painted the most beautiful mural. It took them from 8 o'clock in the morning to midnight. And I have to say, deduction-wise, they put about $1,500 of spray paint onto that mural. And it was just abstract. And it wasn't political or controversial. It was just a beautiful work of art. And it ran the entire 15 months that, that we had this shelter in place. Well, everything gets lifted eventually. Miss Lee rolls in in her Mercedes. And she's like, oh, and she calls me. She's like, Lisa, you're going to jail. And I'm like, I didn't do it. You can paint <laughs> your building. So I'm like, I understand. Buy the paint. I'll paint it for you. I get it. As a property owner, I would get that. 
So I tried to do this conflict resolution. So we paint our property moss green. It's elegant. Melissa, I'm telling you that paint was not even dry. That green paint, I'm covered in green paint, two stories, right? I'm painting it because I want to respect all people. And I didn't paint it, but I know that there's a problem. So let's, let's resolve this. The paint was still wet and all these people came in and they tagged it. And I should have taken a picture to use as an example. It is from top to bottom, not one piece of green is showing. It is silver names, bubble, big bubble letters, big, all kind of just wild style tagging, some horrible messaging. And I'm like, now the only re the only way that DPW will get involved now is if there is gang or anti-Semite messaging on a the wall. They quash that instantly. But if it's just, you know, John loves Jane or I hate Sam or whatever it may be, it's it runs. So wait, wait, wait. So you said, did you say five hundred dollars a day until you buff it? I thought you meant five hundred dollars. They're fined five hundred dollars a until day until you buff that. Yes. Oh my day. goodness. So yeah. it so the, the motivation is let's get out there and take care of this graffiti because the longer you allow graffiti to run on anything, a garbage can, a mailbox, your property, it just encourages more graffiti. So yeah. they want to quash it instantly. So if they don't quash it instantly, it's just gonna turn into this this hot spot. And there are several graffiti hot spots. It's called tagging. So here's the education with graffiti is all aerosol. And it used to be in the day. In the 60s, when this first started, it started with a gentleman, which I love. His name is Daryl. They call him Cornbread. Cornbread was born in, in inner city, Philadelphia. And he was in high school, wanted to impress his girlfriend. Now, we're going, Cornbread's probably, we're going back maybe early 50s or mid-50s, mid this happened. He broke into the Philadelphia Zoo and put Cornbread on in pink letters on a gray elephant, living elephant, an animal, a live animal. Oh. Well, oh, he no. was incarcerated, he was arrested, but he was the first documented person that wrote on anything exterior. Oh, so my that started the graffiti movement, which went to New York City, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and then the trains, and then that went to, came to San Francisco with the wild style. So it's a beautiful journey where it started. So um, so the, the lesson of graffiti is it is aerosol. And um, it used to be Krylon and Rustoleum. Those were the only cans. So there was Black, red, silver, and white, period. That right. was your color palette. So with this evolution of graffiti, and I just spoke to Kelly Moore about this, it is a billion-dollar industry. A can of quality is called Montana, expressly made for the graffiti artist. It goes for like nine fifty a can. And like I said, if you put a fat cap on it, it's gone in a nanosecond. So every mural that you see outside costs between $500 to $1,200 to, to do this mural. And um, when it first started, the tradition was, and I learned this from Cuba, who would speak extensively about this, it was called racking. And you would go into a hardware store and you would rack, as racking is stilling. They would put the paint down their sleeves, in their pants, and they would walk out. And there's blender balls and spray paint. You have to shake it to blend it. Right. And they'd be walking out the door jiggling like these blender balls. And then they would steal caps, different size caps, because your cap is where you get your control. So they steal their paint. And that was, that was the culture. You stole it. You didn't buy it. They probably didn't have money to buy it anyway. You stole your paint, and then you take these caps from like easy off oven spray. Those are yours. Easy off oven spray and Windex, and you put them in your mouth. So you'd have different streams oh. to actually paint your mural with. So that was the culture of it. And then as this evolution came, they start locking up spray paint. If you're in San Francisco and you go to a hardware store, that paint is locked up. You have yeah. to ask for permission to get your paint. And that is the reason why. So somewhere in the early 80s, a two German scientists came up with this paint called Montana. Montana is expressly designed for the aerosol graffiti artist with a pressurized cap, with offering 30 different caps from very thin to get the eyeliner, from very broad to the fat cap. So to get your quality control of your can, it is the, probably the most quality spray paint and it runs the Pantone palette color palette it goes from 15 shades of green 20 shades of orange so you can get all your fades and it's expensive so i said to kelly moore which makes krylon i said to them you're really missing out on this graffiti thing because you should really monetize on designing a spray can paint just for the graffiti artist they did not quite understand that concept but i could tell you from my my experience it is a billion dollar industry that one company is monopolized on wow just saying Anyway, just oh say, so, so, so the graffiti started as just a name, 
somebody's mm-hmm. name. It was Cornbread's name. And then it started into evolving the evolution of a design. Keith Haring was um, known for one of the early graffiti artists with Basquiat. He was known in New York City, Manhattan, for painting these chalk outlines of everything. Big hearts, very childlike in his artistic design. Something that you and I have done all of our lives. Big heart with the little arrows coming out of it. Very whimsical. But it was Madonna that found him. Madonna was walking down Manhattan and said, I love this artist. I'm going to buy his work. And she spent an exorbitant amount of money on one piece. And therefore, Keith Haring now, his pieces go for millions of dollars. Right, These are lithographs. Right. The lithographs go for, you know, 6000 But his originals, they go for, you know, two, three, four million dollars. Let's pause for a moment. We'll be right back. This is why I love hanging out with you, because it's not solely about the art. You bring like all the history and the stories with you, which is amazing because, you know, you lose a lot of that. Um, You know, you don't have a lot of a lot of books on necessarily the graffiti artists you're talking about. Um, So I think it's it's awesome that you kind of keep the history and explain that as well. Um, because it's so important. Thank you for that. And it happened extremely organically because that this was not, graffiti is a whole lexicon of its own. You've got bombing, you've got wild style, you've got a tagging, you've got two color throw ups and it becomes a language side yeah. busting, which is a horrible thing to do. So only because I was in the street and I learned, I mean, I did this, started with this when I was 42 years old and I just turned 64. So I've learned it through, being in it and this you learn this in education you have your clinical and you've got your practical you can read all the books you want until you get on that street and you start hanging around these people it doesn't it's it doesn't translate you You're need right. to be in it to learn it and so because i was in it buying food or talking to them or thanking them or just hanging out with them it became something that you know i just kind of um by osmosis developed but yeah. there's and back to the wild style um wild style was actually developed in san francisco so we had the the name the tag name and tagging is your name and it becomes with my psychological background um, in psychology background, it, when you put your name on something, you identify with it. I don't care if it's a library book or a school book or a garbage can. My name's on it and it belongs to me. What I've deduced, and this is my own assumption and deduction from being in this industry, you have a lot of, and it, the age is anywhere from 12 to 90. I'm not, it's not d- determined by age. You have a lot of a massive humanity that has no identity. Yeah. They are, especially in inner cities, and you see them on the streets and they're lost and they have no direction. They don't have any guidance. And once again, it's not contingent on age. And you'll see them t- writing on, their name on something. And therefore, if my name's on something, therefore I exist. I'm part of this world because my name's here. And I get it. And <clears throat> even though I don't, I think it's still graffiti vandalism, I understand the psychology behind it. So what we've ha- managed to do is give these artists that want a voice and show some kind of interest or talent hopefully both we give them this platform to paint outside where people can actually see them and watch them and talk to them discover them if so and support them with a donation or a can of soda so we've given this platform to show, help artists struggling artists right. or people that are lost have some sort of identity Well, and I mean, that just goes to show you, though, in so many different ways. You know, I know a lot of the schools have lost a lot of the art um, and there's so many challenges with respect to, you know, just highlighting artists. And, you know, art is such a critical aspect of culture and our lives that um, it's so great to see that, you know, you you are kind of putting a different spin on things um, and really bringing I mean, I, you tell me, tell tell the story about the mural with Santana. I mean, that was like yes. incredible. So as we've been doing this for uh, two decades, right, we're painting side streets and we had a great commission with, um, not a commission because it wasn't um, financial at all, but it was very spiritually rewarding. All the California parking lots called us to bring artists to paint the exteriors because they were tagged. So we worked with some some good companies. Um, in the graffiti industry right now, we have probably 
Uh, we work with thousands, but there's a scintilla that are have mastered this form of aerosol. And if anybody is listening to this, has the opportunity to watch anybody paint with aerosol um, other than furniture, please watch it because it is masterful to watch this liquid spray turn into something magnanimous. So there's probably, I can count on five out of my whole collection of artists that can actually wow somebody with an exterior work of art from photo reel to surreal. And it's just everything in between. I can take a picture and say, paint this, and they do it masterfully to spec. So we have had this wall space in the mission and we have 15 blocks in the mission of murals. Probably it is the largest exterior mural project in the world. So I had this property space and it was private, which is a blessing. When you have public spaces, you've got to work with public government, the officers, the officials, Rec and Park, Arts Commission, and they control that. Um, when you have private property, somebody's home, they're like, have at it, paint what you want. I'm not paying for it to do your thing. So we had this space and it was beautiful. And it was right on the 24th Street BART station. If anybody knows where that location is, it is the heartbeat of the Mission District. So I had this two-story property. It was a coffee shop. And it was wooden. It was tired. It was old. I'm like, I need to put something up here that's going to inspire masses of humanity that pour out of this BART station. And I, the numbers pre-COVID was staggering. It was like 100,000 people a day poured out of that one side nation. So you're impacting. As soon as they come up the escalator, all they see is this giant, tired, nasty building falling off with paint hanging everywhere. Like, whatever they see, the first they see a big blue sky, and then this, whatever it is, has to be inspiring. So I'm thinking, and a friend of mine knew Jorge Santana. Jorge Santana, the Santana family grew up about three blocks from the BART station in the mission. They moved from Morisco, Mexico, when they were all very young. And the story was, is Jose Santana and his wife, Josefina, lived, raised, had their family in Juan Jose Santana, probably when he was 20s, late 20s, came to the Mission District from Juan to play as a mariachi. Now, we still have a beautiful mariachi. If you've not seen mariachis walk through all the restaurants, come to the Mission, grab a burrito, and watch these mariachis. They come in, they play their instruments, and they're all syncopated, and they walk around with a little bag, and you give them change. I can't imagine in the 40s there was a lot of money in that because there's not a lot today. But he played as a mariachi and lived here for several years to save enough money to go get his family and bring them back legally. And I think there's eight, seven or eight oh, wow. siblings mm -hmm. um, to bring them back legally to live in the mission. And he wanted a better life for his family. So that was the story that hit me. Like, wow, do you need any more inspiration than that? Because you're working hard. There's no, it's, it's tiring. He's sitting in a house with maybe 10 other guys, musicians, and every day he's out there playing. So I, I wanted to share his story, but I met his son, Jorge Santana. Jorge is Carla Santana's younger brother. And um, he was just lovely. If there was, a, he was such a precious soul that I wanted to just honor him because he was a precious soul. And he was gentle and kind and articulate. And he was like a breeze, just peaceful, no ego, gentle. I took him down one of the streets and he, somebody was sitting on the side of a cement doorstep and he just gently took some money i don't know what denomination out of his pocket and gently handed it to him. he didn't like flash it out you know like here's money he was just very respectful to the person's blight or position and so I, I met him at the gallery two years ago on october 29th and he walked into the gallery to talk to me about this mural with his big bouquet of flowers and i'm like so my birthday is october 30th and i'm like how'd you know it's my oh, birthday tomorrow happy He's like, birthday he said i didn't and I thought, isn't that, I just thought somehow Facebook, whatever, he knows my birthday, no big deal. Um, but he didn't. He just brought in this big bouquet of flowers as a kind gesture of love, which I'm like, who does that? I mean, really? <laughs> so I just, this guy, he was just so beautiful and blessed. So we walked over to this very tired, tattered building that needed some love on it. And I said, I'd love, I'd be honored to honor your family with a mural on this building. And these big tears rolled down his face. He's like, I can't imagine. So he was a great musician. He wrote the song Suavecito, which is the theme of the mission. If you have a chance to Google it, you know it. He played it at Chase Stadium with his brother Carlos. Suavecito is, is my, my husband Randolph is our favorite song. So he wrote the song and he was an excellent musician, but Carlos was the discovered musician. So he kind of, I don't want to say he was in his shadow because he was equally as great, but Carlos made it to fame. 
So he wasn't bitter at all. He was just gently receded from the, the rock and roll thing. So we're talking, I'm like, I definitely want to honor you. What do you see for this mural? And he said, I see Carlos to the left of me. I see myself in the middle, my mom and dad, and I want my nephew Salvador, who's Carlos' son. So there was Carlos Santana, Jorge Santana, Jose Josefina, and Salvador on this mural. And so I said to my husband, Randolph, this is what Jorge wants for his mural. Put it together on a sketch design. So the first process in a design of a mural is to get down to the computer, put all these elements in to the client's request or the, the honoree's request. So Randolph threw together some things. Jorge approved it. We were getting ready. It was privately funded. It was it was a very ambitious job for me. Um, I worked with two other people, Dr. Bernardo Gonzalez and Dr. Andy Rodriguez on this. And the goal was, Dr. Um, Bernardo Gonzalez is the founder of Latin Rock. And the goal was to get people to donate so we can paint this mural. And it was expensive. It's a two-story building. It's wooden. It needed sanded down. It needed primer. It needed a boom lift. It needed insurance. It needed paint. It needed a great artist. So all these factor into a lot of money. Yeah. So we're just getting ready to paint this mural and COVID hits. Oh. So I'm reaching out to Levi Strauss that have funded us before on different projects. I'm like, do you want to be a sponsor? So when you're a sponsor with a mural, we give you a big bronze plaque. We put all the sponsors on it. Like these people made this happen. So it was, we do, um, and belly ceremonies where you get to speak. All the sponsors are a visceral part of this project. I call the people that leave at Harley Davidson. They're like, it's COVID. We have no idea what's going to happen to us. We're shut down. There's no money. I'm like, oh. So I'm like, oh my goodness. And so you talk about faith and prayer and manifestation. I'm like, somebody out there has their money. Somebody has to love the Santana family. So I just start calling everybody I knew from my fine art collectors around the world, Sri Lanka, Singapore, Dubai, Paris. Like, do you want to just sponsor this Germany? People, local people. And honestly, we inched by like $100 at a time, a couple thousand dollar donations, and it was miraculous. And up until the day we had the unveiling ceremony, I was still fundraising. So we get this mural, we're ready to paint, and everything's great. We got some money to start. And I get a phone call. It is Dr. Annie Rodriguez, and she said, I have terrible news. Jorge Santana passed away. I have a massive heart attack in his sleep. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this beautiful, gentle, light spirit that was so honored to be honored is not going to see this. And I was like, what do we do now? Do we carry on posthumously? And I just I just stopped everything. I'm like, do we give the money back? I think we fundraised like $15,000. So we just disperse it back. And I just prayed about it. And I said, sorry, this is really emotional for me. I haven't talked about this since it happened. Um, I just said, he's still with us, right? I know when my yeah. mom passed, I feel her every day. I'm like, we still have to honor him. Even though he's not here, he's on another dimension. He still is here with us. Yeah. And so we did this bureau posthumously in his honor, this big halo around his head. And you can Google all this, Santana yeah. Bureau Mission, and you can see it. Um, so at this point, I'm still like a little bit in shock. We got the COVID situation. The artist is freaking out. So a lot of drama. It was not a seamless mural at all. Um, still trying to fundraise, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it was the story of the Santanas, the Jose and Josefina and Carlos. And the, it was a story that made people open up their wallets. And it's a charitable tax donation. So I'm like cold calling, like on Jerry Lewis on the telephone. Like, it's a tax donation. Anything over $500, I'll give you a letter. Just help me. So we had this you know, handful of people. And I want to say it was probably about 80 people that from around the world that threw some money together. And when we first decided to do this, I had to reach out to Santana, Carlos Santana, to get his permission for his likeness rights. Yeah. So I talked to his gatekeeper, and I'm not going to mention any names, but that man made me cry. He was so, if anybody needs a gatekeeper, this guy is him. He will keep <laughs> everybody away from you. And I know that's his job, but he was, <laughs> woo. I got off the phone and I literally shook and cried. He was just like, what are oh, you talking? No. What are you coming? I'm not giving you any money. I'm like, I'm not asking for anything. We just wanted to honor Jorge and ask for him to you to honor his what wishes. So right, right. I got off that phone call. I'm like, not talking to them again. So <laughs> like, that, it was not even an option. So it took about a year. It took about a year to manifest this mural. So last October, your timing is perfect on this on this call. <laughs> last October 29th. Um, let's go back three days before October. Let's say around the 26th of October, the mural's done. 
and we're proud of it. And so I work with BART and I work with DPW and I work with SFMTA for our little projects festivals. And, and I have a great relationship because I support art festivals, me, Randolph, we give them, we give money to get the permits and get the food vendors and get all these artists together to support the arts. They get the proceeds. We do it around the BART station. We've done it for 10 years. It is cost prohibitive for us to do this every year. With the, it was once a month. Yeah. So there'd be rent and there'd be the festival. There's rent and festival. That's all we lived, rent and festival. So because of that ship, I said to BART, hey guys, we just need to shut down a little portion of this have any money i have no money for anything they're like just take this little sliver and have this all ceremony they're like this, all we need is a sliver and now between the mural and the bar station there's a little street called osage street and it's just a little tiny service alley but it's still a road so i'm like hey sfmta can you maybe shut this all down here just for like five ten minutes a half an hour they're like nah, i can't do it lisa i'm like Okay, fine. So we have the neuron belling that we've got to be over at the board station. You can still see it. Not a problem. So two days before the unveiling ceremony, I get a phone call from the man that made me cry, the gatekeeper. And he's like, change of direction. Carlos wants to attend. Wow. <laughs> Carl and his whole family. So they oh, took that opportunity. Okay. And here's the blessing. And this is the tapestry of spirituality and living your life where God wants you to be. We did this mural tall order it, it happened it was done and then it turned out to be a memorial service for jorge for the family yeah. and all the siblings and the cousins and the uh, extended family it was not only london breed and bevan defty from bart the director and the sfmda and dpw and all the powers that be the police department the fire department everybody showed up but it was a whole entire santana family and they shut down the bart station for that which wow. never happens. And if you did have the money to make it happen, it would take you years to get a permit. They shut it down in 24 hours. So wow. I'm like, okay, so all that labor, all that community service, I guess I did a really great job. So we had this mural unveiling ceremony, which was, as I look back in retrospect, a year later on that celebration, it was nothing short of a miracle. Yeah. It was an honor. It was for Jorge. Jorge made that happen spiritually. But Carlos Santana does not come back to the mission. He hasn't been back here publicly. He may drive through or whatever since he left. Yeah. So he goes to Chase Stadium. But it was pretty epic because he grew up here. And I couldn't advertise any of this because it would have been a mob scene. If we would right. have advertised, it was all oh, there was yeah. no press release until after it happened and everybody was safely said, said gone. But it was really interesting because when he gave the speech at the end, he had been, and if you pull it up online, you'll see a copy of the speech. But he said, um, to paraphrase, of course, and the people were standing all around the side because there's something they knew something was happening. And then, of course, the loudspeaker, because they knew it was Carlos. But he said, and, um, just, and I'm paraphrasing, everybody is destined for greatness. And his his tone of that was so amazingly sincere that man is so spiritual that he probably does not touch the ground when he walks his heart and that's why why he has people around him to guard him from things because his spirituality shined like a beacon and he was passionate and he was you know emotional he said you know this is for my brother Jorge and he just went to a different zip code he said you know he just passed on to a different realm don't ever let anybody tell you, you can't do something and he said well i'll, I'll see you on the, in the next dimension we yeah. all live somewhere forever and that messaging was just it reverberated it touched many lives and just reverberated around the whole mission district it was something that i did not do it was not about lisa doing it or randolph doing it it was something that that was a hand of god and jorge that i could never manifest in that so that's, that's what we do. And we did the same thing with Earl Gage Jr., who was the first black firefighter of San Francisco. This man, he opened the door for people of color and, and transgender and different you know, walks of life to enter into the fire department. It was Irish. It was old school. It was a club. You would not be a fireman. He entered into this at the heart of like segregation and you know, Martin Luther King, you know, he, he walked into the party, but I'm like, I want to be, I would have ran the other way. I'm like, that's not for me. And his daughter, Blondell Chisholm, Dr. Chisholm talked about that. She said, my dad, he feared for his life every day going to work, mm -hmm. but he, he was tenacious and they, they abused him. They threatened his life. They hung him off of buildings. They'd urinate on his cot. 
he he had to take his old mattress home because when you work for the party department, you sleep there for a couple of days. Yeah. Then go home for a couple of days. He was in that awful situation for days with these people yeah. abusing him and rose above it and became wow. a civil rights leader and an activist and retired from the fire department. Who deserves, you talk about uh, honoring a hero. So um, my very good friend, Captain Sherman Tillman, who was at that time, the president of the Black Firefighters Association, great organization. Um, Sherman said, Lisa, I need, wanted to honor Earl Gage on this mural. Um, and I said, absolutely. So we pulled in an artist by the name of Crayon. His proper name is Rigel Javadavak. Rigel is... Korean and uh, mid east, mid um, I think European, Hungarians, um, but a great guy. Been, he's a pioneer in the graffiti world. He started spray painting. He started break dancing when he was twelve. Break dancing, hip hop, break dancing, spray painting is kind of it's one big family. So he went from hip uh, from break dancing to spray paint. I'm talking twelve years old. He just turned like fifty five. He has he's a legend. He can paint a portrait with a can of aerosol can, like it looks like he took a little tiny brush. So he was my artist of choice to paint this mural and for Earl Gage. And we honored Earl Gage during Black History Month, yeah. which I have to say was nothing short of a miracle. So in this process, we're ready to paint again. And Crayon's in the fire department. He's ready to hit the wall, got the mural design. And it's a triptych. It's a three panel mural on the side of Rosa Parks School in the Fillmore. And it's a massive exterior space. And when you have a triptych, you have to have a continuity a theme. You just, just one big picture, it's, you, it's broken up. So you've got right. to have this biggest theme. So it is the day he's, this is Monday. he's going to paint on Monday. We're going to meet him at the school. I have his lunch. Sunday night at the fire department, they do drills. Three o'clock in the morning, rushes into the fire truck. He slid on this fire truck, broke his arm, has pins in it, in the hospital, major surgery. I had to get an a artist to paint the mural, which was Wes Marks. Wes Marks came in. Crayon broke his hand. He, it was not just broken. It was smashed. Um, it got stuck in the fire, um, the handle, and he slid under the fire truck. So it was just gone. Oh Wes Wong came God. in and painted the mural. So there's always these, you have to pivot and adjust and change, but it's, it's a family. So oh when we, God. well, how, how is Crayon now? He's ready to paint again. He's <laughs> going to be painting a beautiful oh. mural in Japan. So. Thank God for yeah. that. My it God. Took about, it took about That's a terrible. year and a half. Well, it took a year actually to heal. Wow. That's yes. incredible. Well, so that's our story. That's what we do. And um, the, what I really like to say is people don't ever negate the power of art, yeah. especially the power of art in innocuous places you never expect. You're walking down the street and you see something that wows you. If you go to, you know, the MoMA or you know, the De Young or the Met, you expect oh, wow. to see great art. But when you're walking down the street, something inspires you. That is magical. And yeah. It's the power to change your perspective, your attitude, everything. I love so it. That, that's what we do. And we honor not only the artists that paint for us, but we honor celebrities and people that deserve to be celebrated in that process. Well, and that's what I love is that when you talk about inclusion, I mean, you go through the different alleys and look at all the murals. You have people from everywhere um, with different perspectives on you know, coming from there. I, th I remember an artist from Brazil you were talking about. Yep. And I mean, there's just, there's so much culture coming to be represented on these murals, which is fabulous. It is. And it's, it's the diversity that makes it really spectacular because they're everybody art is kind of unique in itself, but then you have an artistic style from Brazil that is nothing you see in America. And then we had an artist that came in from Dubai and it was Farsi and it was you know, more, um, it's just a different flavor, but it's all one art love. It's, it, art and they all music, work together. Oh, they, they all, all work, work together. together. Yeah. Yes. It's awesome. And I, I think I shared that story. We had a mural. There was a gentleman. He was he, he was Mayan by um, heritage. Mayan and African-American. And Mark Bodie was Irish. And it was five of these artists. One was Mideastern. The other was from the Bronx. So they came from these different walks of life, different socioeconomic levels, and different ethnicities. But they were up on the scaffolding painting this mural with complete love, respect, and solidarity. And I stepped back. And this was about maybe six months into our project when we first started. And I watched this and I, it hit me and I stood back and I'm watching these 
egos. I mean, I'm talking independently. They all had their giant egos. They all had their different personalities. They were all a little bit challenging to work with, but they're working together without a flaw with love. And I'm like, this would never happen in any other environment. It wouldn't happen in a restaurant. It wouldn't happen in a nightclub. It would not happen. So I realized then that love is that universal language between art and music. Oh, and it yeah. connects all of us. I love it. That's awesome. Well, I mean, it's amazing to see all of the things that you're doing. I know you're sitting in Mission 415 Gallery. Yes, so I am. Do you want to do you want to talk to us a little bit about what you do there at Mission 415? Yes, I would. I would love to. I'm honored. I'm honored to be here. So when we started the mural project, um, and it was a it was a process. I was still working at a very fine art gallery down at the Embarcadero, and it was all wilderness landscape. And it was like Ansel Adams' protege. His name is Rodney Lowe Jr. And it was massive works of art from Yosemite and Yellowstone, and it, they started at twenty thousand dollars. And I'm at the I'm at the tourist enclave of San Francisco, so I'm meeting people from all around the world. Um, the people buying this art came in from every walk of life everywhere. I mean, it was the most magical experience to network because not only I saw like, amazing American lands, you know, um, national park landscapes, but it was all large format film, eight by 10 film in the day of digital is unheard of. So the detail was unprecedented and the, the art was framed magically and it was massive. Nothing that would fit into a flat in San Francisco. You'd need a mansion for this art. So the people that came in to buy this, they were qualifying people, obviously, but they came in from all over the world. So my networking connections started there. So I would work at this gallery and I loved what I did because I loved working with people and giving them beautiful things to inspire their home. And for whoever's listening, if you don't have great art on your wall, it doesn't have to be expensive art. It has to be inspiring art. What you look at every day affects you consciously and subconsciously. Not only that, it sets the, the tone for your home or your office. If you have a Heineken beer poster up, it's going to tell me everything I need to know about you. And that's how you're going to feel. And that's how you're going to act. You put something magical, like what you see here behind you, underwater um, photography, it gives you this whole spiritual feeling. So I mastered the skill of selling this landscape art because I loved it. And when I love something, I can my passion kind of jumps onto somebody else and they kind of love it too. You so don't it's say. this gallery. <laughs> I'm in this gallery loving my job and I'm the top salesperson. I'm just loving it. But it is a nine to five. It is a suit. It's a briefcase. It's high heels. And it's not that come home and jump through the alleys and do that thing. So I'm like, I really, I need to do one or the other. I can't do both anymore. I'm getting tired. I'm working 16 hours a day on both Mission R415, the Lilac Mural Project and this gallery. So I, um, at that gallery, I had an opportunity to go to Singapore to, to open a gallery. Now, if anybody's been to Singapore, it is. It's so wealthy. Wonderful. If you think San Francisco is expensive, Singapore raises the bar. So <laughs> I, was, I met this gentleman that was from Sri Lanka. He's like, I want you to open up an art gallery in, in Singapore. I'm like, oh, I have to. So I said to Randolph, I have a new job. I'm going to Singapore. I cannot miss this opportunity. And he's like, are you kidding me? It's like this 18 hour flight, you know, one way. I'm like, I have to do it. And it was located at Raffles Hotel. Now let me describe nice. Raffles Hotel. Yeah. It is, it's, it's British in, in architecture. It is opulent. I would walk in like, I can't believe God, is this really my life? I'm working at this opulent hotel, Lanai's everywhere. So I was there for a couple of years um, running this. Story. And then it just became too, it tends between my husband being in San Francisco and me being in Singapore. We're Zooming, but you can't really commute. It's just, it's not for a long-term relationship. And I just really missed home. So I said to my boss, I got to go, I'm leaving. So I came back to the United States, came back to San Francisco. And I'm like, well, now what? <laughs> now what do I do? And it just made sense. I said to myself, talk about manifestation. There was a little tiny space gallery storefront between our projects so the mission the Lilac mural project is actually 14 blocks but it's a linear line and it's just it's 14 blocks it's it's flat so all you have to do is walk like this well this little storefront was right in the middle of those blocks like what better place to sit down use it as my office use it as a headquarters i can still broker art internationally but better than that i can put all the artists outside in this gallery so I'm not, usually when you work with an artist that is his own artist, like um, Peter Lick is another landscape photographer that made a lot of money in Las Vegas. It's an, it's called an ego gallery. One artist occupying the whole wall. 
But this has, my little gallery space has 35 artists and every artist in here has painted outside for us. So okay. when I do a mural tour, I talk about these artists that donated their time and talent. We didn't pay them. We gave them supplies, but they were out there under their own sweat equity and turned this into this. This is them. They did this. Yeah. So I can actually talk about their dedication and what they've contributed and their ideology and their artistic style. And then when you come back to the gallery, you kind of, you're familiar with Night Owl and Nate Tan and Mark Bodie and other artists that we have in here that have painted for us for 20 years. Yeah. So that's what we do here in this gallery. And we, I give free mural tours. I don't charge for them. How dare I charge for something that's free? <laughs> so we, we do mural tours and you know, we've had a couple of people, you know, offer donations, which was a blessing. We put it back towards paint, but it's more about talking about this happening. And it's yeah. just two people doing the right thing. Two people that cared enough to change where they lived, to change artists' lives, to inspire people. And it's reciprocity. And that's the yeah. circle of life. Well, I still believe that if, if you go to San Francisco and you want uh, it's like being on a tour. Like, you know, when you take a cruise and you go on a tour, that's what being with you is like. Because you are telling everybody the whole story, the history, the culture. I mean, there's so many different components to it. So it's such a joy. And, and we're honored because we've, we've helped, we've helped children put them through college. We've helped it's become our family. It's our fa every Thanksgiving we open up our doors and we feed everybody that doesn't have anywhere to go. It's become something that somebody these young artists can count on. Yeah. They don't have a mom. Mom's absent. Dad with the note he didn't know. And we've had several cases like that where he's misguided. They were on the cusp of either going to a bad dark path or they were going to make something of themselves. And they could have chose heroin or graphic design, and they chose graphic design. And I always growing up in my life. Thank God. People would ask you what you want to be. I'm like, if I could change one person's life, that's all I need to do. Yeah. I don't have to do anything other than change, help one person change their life. And Randolph and I have done that. And we're honored. Uh, to and do I it. love that. I love that. I mean, you, you know, my husband was a storyteller. And so his focus was all about oral tradition, storytelling and performing arts. But, um, you know, when I think about, arts and you know all of the all of the components of art it's such a treasure and i think unfortunate it's unfortunate that funding has eliminated it from schools for kids and because it is really then that these young artists identify and really start to understand like you know maybe i'm not going into an office but I'm an artist and I want to do this. Um, and so it's wonderful to see that you're making such a transformational change and really incorporating inclusion into everything you're doing over there in the mission, which is awesome. Thank you. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It's my honor to be here. I don't think people realize how expensive art supplies are. You've yeah. got the canvas, you've got the, the, the paint brushes, the, the materials. And when we can offer a free exterior canvas as your palette and give you your paints and put you in front of it, it not only is it cathartic for the human being, for the soul, but it gives them an opportunity to, hey, I like this and maybe I can choose this as a profession or maybe I can just come out and have a cathartic day. So it, it just works. Yes. And you are, if I were, and I'm looking now, so your website is missionart415sf.org. Dot org. Yes. <laughs> yep. So it's, um, and you know, people should go and check it out because it's, I mean, the mural projects, I wasn't, you know, I've seen murals, you know, people paint murals, but the fact that you have made this a process for you know, rotation of art um, on homes throughout the mission. It is, it is an incredible sight. So um, well, thank I mean, you. And it was an honor having you here, but honestly, your viewers are more than welcome. Call me, um, call me. We'll do a tour. It's personal. Bring 30 people, bring yourself. <laughs> it's, it's something that I love to share because the story It's just, it's inspiring to that. We all know that we can do, we can all be heroes. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much for being here, Lisa. It was yes. such a treasure. 
you have such a treasure trove of information. Um, so I'm glad we could pull some of it out of you. And um, I encourage everybody, if you haven't been to the mission and seen the the um, Lilac Project from Mission 415 in San Francisco, check it out because it is Please. fabulous. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you for all the good that you do around the world. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you okay. so much. Okay, Lee. Thanks for joining me on the Jolly Podcast. Please subscribe so you won't miss an episode. See you next week. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com. Thank <laughs> you.